Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. And this week, we are flying over to France. Yeah, we're excited to hang out with Cedric for a couple for an hour. He's come to talk a little bit about Paris, I think, specifically, right? Yes. Hello, everyone. And thanks for having me. So, yeah, I, I play in France, but uh, I'm located in Paris and I act, I mean, I play most of the time with players from Paris. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're excited to hear about, you know, a little bit about the separate French groups. I think when we were scouting out this podcast, it sounded like, you know, there's a lot of corralling all of the separate groups in France to kind of be under one umbrella. So it sounds like that's that's happened because you sent us a website. Looks like there's like a circuit that you guys are walking down to the October 8th tournament. Yes, exactly. Yes. We, um, I mean, it started with the announcements from games like I think it was in January to mm -hmm. talk about the circuit and the finally in Atlanta. And so, I mean, we have a lot of groups on uh, different heroes in France. Uh, it's mostly like uh, split by city, to be honest. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we just discussed and being, I think we were able to just plan something like for the, the whole year. And that went super well. So that's that's great. Yeah. And, you know, as far as like talking about specific teams, it sounds like you've got some commandos and some chaos cults stuff. So that's probably what we're going to be talking about when we get to the nitty gritty on the niche tactics and operative showdown this week. Sounds good. But before we get to that stuff, Jason. Yes, we would. So for anyone that's been listening so far and enjoying the content, um, we've got a Patreon. We're going to have a link in the description and you can join that. And speaking of which, we would like to shout out Low Bro or low brow. I'm actually not sure how he pronounces it uh, for subscribing to the Patreon. Thank you so much. Podcast guest, you know, if you want to hear about the Pacific Northwest scene, he's our first Patreon subscriber and he's been on the podcast, I think a couple weeks ago. That's true. So before we get into, you know, the kill team stuff, what have you guys been up to recently? I've been, I've been playing Doom Eternal. PlayStation gives out games for free every now and then, and that was one of them. And uh, I'm always, like, five years behind on video games, so, like, Doom Eternal for free, I was like, I'll try it out. And uh, just playing on easy mode, jumping around, punching demons, easy. Playing a space brain, right? Basically, yeah. What about you, Cedric? So I've been uh, playing uh, quite a lot of uh, Baldur's Gates these days oh, with uh, yep. a group of friends. That's uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, which but, act uh, are you on? Uh, <laughs> I think we are we are still in the first act. We we st we take a lot of time to do everything, but we also restarted a lot of times just to see like the all the different options you have. So that's we take our time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Baldur's Gate is incredible. So like, I finished it a couple weeks ago, and yeah, a plus game. If anyone <laughs> wants to play a strategy or like a tactics game outside of Kill Team, Baldur's Gate is definitely worth picking up with some friends. Not gonna lie, I'm gonna write it down on my list and probably play it in like three years. Yeah, I've been, I'm back on Cyberpunk now that they've done the update. Uh, much improved, actually, over the release. Oh, I haven't tried yet, so I'm curious to yeah. see. But, you know, the topic today is uh, we're talking about French Kill Team. Yes, you've got a web app. Let's, like, tell us a little bit more about that. So basically the idea was to have like um, kind of a common place where we can just uh, list informations mostly uh, related to the circuits we run this year. Um, I think we have like different BS to communicate. We have like a kind of big Facebook group. Like uh, I think there are something like 3K people in uh, the, the group called Kill Team Friends. Uh, we also have another Discord group. Uh, I mean, also Kill Team Friends, but uh, with less people, but it's also pretty new compared to the Facebook page. Uh, there's, there's about some uh, 500 people. And so the idea was to have like something more uh, static to be able to list like the events, the results, and uh, also the rankings for the, the league. So yeah, I think we basically list like all the events, all the top threes, I think. And we have also the, 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 the final ranking. Nice. And, and out of the, eight next, uh, looking at the website, is your grand finale just eight invite players? Yes, there will be only eight players. So the top eight, I think it's not up to date, actually, the, the ranking, but the top eight players will take part to an event, like an invitational event. Uh, right. And because we have two golden tickets, 
the top two for this event will get uh, the tickets and be able to go to Atlanta. Nice. Are you guys doing a player funded ticket like Spain is, or how are you guys funding your tickets? Well, the thing is that uh, in France, the events are much, much slow, um, like uh, smaller than uh, they are in uh, maybe Spain and or the UK and even like uh, the, the US. So we are mm -hmm. not able to do that for this edition. Uh, also, the problem was that we went for this kind of league. And so I think it will be super late for to get the plane tickets and all that. So I think this year people will just have to pay themselves, which is kind of a big issue because yeah. uh, most of them might not be able to pay for that. So I think we'll just create some kind of port or something to see if we can help uh, those, the, the, the winners. And next year, we I think we'll try to find a better approach for all that. Maybe you have like uh, one or two events where you can directly get one ticket and just one ticket to deliver at the end of the season, but it will allow us, uh, us to have more time to get uh, to form the the tickets basically. Yeah. Do you guys play more in the dark or more open? I know you know different scenes all have their different preferences, and I know um, you know Pacific Northwest has no in the dark, whereas you know every once in a while, I think the upcoming London Grand Tournament, uh, I think it'll be done by the time this podcast comes out, but they're doing all in the dark still. So I'm just curious, what what's going on in um, the French scene as far as terrain goes? I think that for all the events we had this season, uh, all of them were like mixed terrains. Nice, yeah. The tables you... were open and half was ITD. I see, I see. So like the normal, the normal mix that everyone, I think most of us have decided is more fun than all open or all in the dark. Yeah, exactly. I think that's why, and also. Uh, I know that, uh, for example, Francois Linnet, uh, he had like uh, he acquired a, like, a, a ton of uh, ITD terrain, so he was able to run um, big events with like a lot of tables for ITD. But uh, yeah, other than that, it's pretty hard to like have I don't know something like 15 or 20 tables for open and the same for ITD. So it's easier right. to have kind of mixed terrains, and it's more fun. I uh, but that's it's just more approachable. I think. I think from what we've seen for a lot of people in the dark it ends up being a little bit easier to teach for new players. Have you found that to be kind of similar in France? Um, yes and no. I think um, when I try to onboard new people, uh, I try to avoid ITT most of the time. Mm. Uh, just because I think, but again, that's personal opinion, but uh, I think it's it takes a lot of time to set up. And it's uh, kind okay. of pretty easy to like just set up an open world. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, once that's done, it's not, and I think it's not that hard to start with uh, Into the Dark once you know the basics in Open. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yes. But um, yeah, most of the time uh, we try to onboard on Open, I think. Yeah. So I'm curious when you do Open boards, are you doing like predetermined layouts? Or are you doing like player placed? Or what's what do you do for terrain layout for Open boards? Uh, I think it's. It's not. Uh, I mean, it's very dependent on the TO. Uh, initially, we are not like that fond of uh, predetermined terrain because my opinion on that is that I think it's easier for people who have time to just like kind of farm the setups to just know like all the best lines. Uh, just to, I mean, you can't have like the perfect setup, but you can be more than ready. And uh, I think I prefer to have like something where you have to actually think something new every game, basically. Yeah. But uh, more recently, I think we kind of all agreed to go for uh, the turning point tactics packs most of the time, just because it's kind of easy and the maps are pretty pretty cool. So, yeah, again, I think it depends on the TOs. Uh, I know that uh, Francois, I think for his tournament, it was like um, a pack he designed himself. Uh, so, yeah, okay. it really depends. So he had his own predetermined maps that he liked? Uh, say that again, sorry? Uh, Francois, what, he had his own map packet that he was doing? Yeah, yeah, he created a, a map packet. I'm not sure he, he, he shared it, but uh, he just had like a, like a set of maps uh, he prepared for the, the tournament. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always a very contentious issue, I think, is how to yeah. set up maps where everyone feels like they have some control over their fates rather than just... Oh, this map sucks for me. Yeah, no, and I like like the the fact that you need to adapt, and I think that's also a good um, a good point for the mixed environments compared to only open or ITDs that you have to think about. Like you can't just take something like uh, very strong in open or very strong in ITD. You have to have something a little bit good uh, for both of them. 
Yeah, it definitely know, helps. The same with terrain. Yeah, it definitely helps incentivize kind of you know having more than one play style on a team. Like the teams that have that can play both shooting and melee have been doing much better since the the mix format became more popular. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of having flexibility between shooting and melee, today for the operative showdown, operative showdown, we are going to be jumping into the world of commandos, and if we're ready for that, um, we've got a little section for for each of the sort of like templates within. Where um, when it comes to the the melee boys, we've got the slasher and the breacher. Is there one that jumps out to you as the MVP in that matchup, and if so, why? So between the slasher and the breacher, yep. Um, I think I, I kind of like the breacher just because it's so fun to be able to just hide somewhere and uh, like you think you are. I mean, the opponent thinks he's pretty far away, and then when you were able to just go through everything, you are not that far anymore. Um, I tend to play it a lot with, uh, I mean, uh, mostly on open, but with uh, the dynamite, but. The downside of it is that it's pretty obvious what you are going to prepare, and also you need to give him one APL and all that. Um, but I and also like the weapon profile is not that good, I think. So yeah, you three attacks to on. Bring a the, yeah. Yeah. So you are you're always giving him equipment before sending him out into the field. Yeah, most of the time. Compared to the slasher, who is just like a like really good with the relentless Chopa, basically. Yeah. Have you ever gotten use out of his uh, survival uh, survival thing on the slasher? Sorry, you said it. Uh, yeah. Oh, the slash ability where he like headbutts you <laughs> when you survive. Yeah. I, I don't know if I was able to just uh, get anything out of that, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's actually pretty good. Uh, like just the relentless on the chopper profile is just insane. So. <laughs> But do you find that the slasher and the breacher play similar roles in your games, or do you use you use them like as very different pieces? Like breacher goes forward with the dynamite, and the slasher hangs back as kind of like a second line threat, or does the slasher often go up with the breacher as two front line threats? Um, I think most of the time I go like on the um, one side of the board with the slasher, where maybe the breacher is more like a centerpiece. Like I try to place it in the middle, and then because you can just go basically everywhere. I am able to go on one side or the other, or just keep pushing in the middle if needed. So... I see. So you use the breacher as kind of like central control because he has a twelve-inch bubble of blast. Yeah, exactly. And also, he's a good candidate, I think, for sneaky git. But uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So you, you you know, there's one spot where I've seen the slasher has been pretty good as one of those forward pieces, and that's when you're playing against like someone like Colts. Where you sneaky get super far forward so that no one on their side can move on turn one and you can jump people. Yeah, just you, yeah. you are able to just uh, rush into uh, into the the, the the other team and you can basically just block the the cultist before they mutate. So that's mm, yeah, yeah, against cults, the slasher going up forward or like the knob. Like you don't want to send the knob up forward because if the knob dies, you know you lose a lot of power. But if the slasher goes up and kills a leader or the mind witch or something and then threatens a bunch of other models on turn one it generally is doing enough work where the rest of the guys can support yep yep exactly yeah and then our next chunk is the between some of the shooting models you know the differences between the rocket and the sniper like where do you place them how do you use them are they your frontline pieces or you know which one do you lean on more i think i kind of prefer the, the rocket um just because it's more reliable if you are able to set up the shoot with the rerolls. Uh, I think it's especially true with the um, open setup. I don't mm -hmm. know what you think about that, but uh, it's, it tends to be harder for my, my experience to set up the shoot with rerolls uh, in ITD. Or maybe it depends on the initiative for next turn. So yeah, that's that's the reason why I think I prefer the work kit. Also, the, the snipper is kind of... Uh, it's either it goes super well or it goes super wrong. I think at one game I was able to almost kill Vulgar with oh. unlikely, I think. Oh, we <laughs> had to just not roll anything or just like a regular hit, and that's that's the same. Yeah, the same it's really thing. fishing. The sniper is really fishing for crits the whole time. Yeah. Do you find that you're often um, doing the two AP action to do the conceal shoot on your sniper? 
Um, actually, maybe more in open when I sneak kick it, because I'm okay. able to just find a, a spot where I, I know I will be able to shoot, or mm -hmm. when the opponent will need to move and just be able to hide behind like light cover or something like that. So yeah, um, I I try, but I don't like always rely on that. I think. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, using him as a moving piece that actually has good ballistic skills, so you can like chip models. The whole time, right? Yeah, and also you know, I think in ITD, I, I even give him um, a pass sometimes. Okay, just yeah, to so he's to, a uh, mixed piece. You like a second or third line. <laughs> if yeah. yeah, yeah, the sniper boy, you know, six attacks on threes, two, four effectively, but two, two mortal wounds too. So on in the dark, if you give him a chopper or the, the sledgehammer, sledgehammers, <laughs> have you ever used a sledgehammer? No, I have, I have never. I've actually seen a handful of people use a sledgehammer pretty well. The stun actually matters a fair amount in melee. But at, at any rate, you know, on in the dark, that means that now you've got a six dice on threes, two, four gun, wandering around with the four dice on threes, four, five melee weapon, which is pretty, pretty solid profile. Yeah, that's really cool. It's like, I think it's the same thing with the Donna, where people just say it's, um, it's basically a, a regular boy, but with a flamer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that you know we need to give him some uh, chopper, but uh, yeah, I think I, I try to to use it more and more like that with the sniper. So yeah, yeah. I, at least on in the dark, you really want to yeah. be able to have pieces that can do a little bit of everything. So being able to like, because I think for the sniper, you can actually chip a model down, and that model can't really charge you, right? Because if you do yeah. enough damage in melee, you've got ten wounds with just a scratch. So being able to use it as a counter punching piece is also pretty nice. Yeah, and you can just always. I think um, you can always like try to parry as much as possible, survive, and be a, a threat for next turn if you if you were charged. So yeah. Yeah, and you also have crumple at the end of the turn too. Yes, so. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and you can. Yeah, you, so... you pretty much always be able to just uh, at least land one hit, which is already like uh, four damage. And if you yeah. always yeah, yeah. survive, so that's that's pretty. And uh, one big thing that I don't know if everyone knows this for the Rocket Boy, um, if you shoot before moving you can always move afterwards so on open you can definitely shoot get the full rerolls and then run away afterwards yeah i try to go for that uh, all the time <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i'm sure it's very yeah, frustrating to for fight me. another day cool um and then the the next section in the operative showdown is the fancy boys uh we've got the comms and the grot which one do you find as a, a better utility piece um that you you lean on more or like what's what's the cool play for each one <laughs> i think both of them are insane uh, they are insanely good like the um, the free action mission action on the the comms is or is it's great, especially with a team uh, full of two AP APLs mm -hmm. models. So um, you can do that. Also, the um, the ability to just give one APL to uh, a team. Like I think I tried to give it either to the um, the one wearing the um, the dynamite, or even sometimes the um, the bomb squig if you want to like uh, move dash and then explode something like that. So you have so many options. And um, I think the, the weapon is also pretty good sometimes. Like if you are able to just uh, stun by shooting on the um, on enemy on the on an objective, and then be able to just uh, sneaky take the <laughs> the objective, it's pretty it's pretty cool. But, yeah, uh, it's, you can drop someone the, you can drop someone's APL and then move on top of a point. Yeah, exactly. It happens. Like I I think for me it happens. Just once or twice, but uh, when it happens, it's really cool. And, and then, what, um, yeah. what, what, what is your fanciest play with the grot? Or, like, which one? Yeah, tell us a little bit about your grot play. Well, the grot, I think I, I like it to score like secondaries most of the time. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you are able to just like uh, move from one place on, on the board to the other. And so I was able, I think, in uh, either ITD or open to just uh, like go from one side of the board to the other and just score secondaries, uh, like infiltrate where you need to either like uh, take barricades. It's also nice because if there is no models, you can just hide. And because you have super concealed, you are pretty safe. I'd mm -hmm. say. And it's the same in open, actually. Um, also, with Into the Dark, there are some like nice uh, things where you can just like uh, dash behind the wall. And because it's it, you don't have to land the model right where we you aim but you have to land like 
one inch away, you can just hide and also you are always concealed. So it's getting harder for the teams to come and get you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think against like elite teams, when you have six models, it's kind of a pain if you have to just uh, run after a small grot in your, in your back lane. Yeah, you don't want to waste time on the grot. Which which um which tack ops are you using to score with the grot more often than not? Uh, so I'm really bad with the names, but the one where you, I think not exactly the one with barricades because it's kind of, uh, I think it doesn't happen like too often, especially in ITD. Mm -hmm. But uh, I try to get the the one with the barricades uh, when I can. I think it's seize defenses. I think it's seize defenses. Yep. And there's subversive control, which is control an opposing objective on turns three oh, and four. Yeah, and also the one where you need to just be uh, like fully within the enemy uh, zone, and then you are you just need to be outside of three inches from another. I think uh, gather intelligence. Yes, exactly this one. So I think it's in, in uh, open. It's super easy to score it with the the grot because most of the time I think the opponents were when I talked about that they just said yeah I, I can't just run after this this one like uh, for the whole game so do whatever you want with your grot. <laughs> They're just giving you the points, huh? Yeah, yeah. And I think it was that before the the cricket with the crit ups when you were able to just like uh, dash into the zone, get the oh yeah interloper. Yeah, interloper, and also the one where you just needed to be in the deployment zone from the uh, opponent. That was like mm -hmm. one action and three VPs. That's always yeah. He, that he's one. always been really good at scoring scoring things. But yeah, it's good to hear that. So you're taking. So it sounds like you play infiltration a fair amount, then, right? Um, I think I try to play uh, seek and destroy most of the time against odds mm -hmm. or semi odds. But against elite, I think it's more. It's much easier to to score. I see. Yeah, it lets you split up their activations because they only have six aggressive yeah. activations. So if you force them to go deal with your grot, you get a little bit of value out of yeah. switching over infiltration. And also, it's uh, I think it's always really hard to ensure you will be able to just kill somebody. Like it, if you take if I take like um, uh, second destroy, I might be I mean I might have hard times to ensure the second VP for. Um, uh, uh, you're thinking, oh, it's uh, for eliminate guards because you might have killed too many. Yeah, or even or, yeah. these ones. I sometimes it's hard when you don't have like much, much, much more modern in, at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can just pretty can, hard against smaller teams. Yeah, I kind of like uh, inspiration for that. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, between the two of them, I think one of the big comms plays that you can do is you know move give yourself the apl so you're, you can as a three apl model for the your activation and free mission action away so you can steal points from two apl models yeah or you can you know zap someone and then do the same thing also i think you can just do it or and yeah, just move on the the point and for example tap for loot or something like that yeah yeah well i mean if you're playing against another uh two apl model you can't do it unless you have three apl yeah, or yeah. they've been minus so you can actually listen in to yourself, give yourself three APL that's temporary, and then steal the steal the objective because you'll count as three. So that's a fun little trick play for the comms boy. That is a fun little trick play. Do you think the team needs a nerf, Cedric? So I think like uh, probably. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think like uh, when I checked last time, they were at something like fifty-eight or sixty percent win rate or something like that. Do you feel like the French scene kind of doesn't enjoy them being as good as they are right now? No, I don't think they are like, I mean, they are not as hated as the as Pathfinders or Chaos Cult were, <laughs> I think. Okay. Um, not, yeah, right. We don't have like tons of commandos as well. Oh, but, interesting. Um, yeah, we, we, we had some, but uh, yeah. And um, yeah, I think the the problem, the biggest problem I see is the probably the sneaky git spam in open, mm -hmm. and maybe like the yeah, I think it's it was even before like even the before they get buffed, uh, I think it was already a pretty hard team to fight against, and for some reason people don't really didn't really play them at that time. I know that um, they, they were like they kind of showed up again when they, when they get buffed, and also because they were like pretty good counters, or at least like the best counters against Chaos Cult. Or oh, yeah, they were definitely the best. Probably. They were definitely the best open counter to Colts, I think. Yeah, and now these teams are uh, got nerfed uh, like pretty hardly, I think. And so 
I think that it would make sense to just, uh, yeah, probably nerf them a little bit, but I don't know how, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah, like, uh, just a scratch is insanely good and just so annoying, but... Uh... Yeah, I think just a scratch is probably, like, four to, like, the orc identity. I think the thing that I've been looking at is maybe bring them back to ten activations, but maybe pairing the GA2 of the bomb squig with maybe not the commander grot. Maybe you could, like, nominate a boy to be like the runt herder so he like he pairs with the the explosive bomb squig that could be kind of cool oh, and add a little bit more flavor to the team yeah i don't know because i think like the i saw the, some discussions about this um on discord somewhere mm -hmm. and uh someone was mentioning the fact that sometimes like we saw that um for some teams like uh j2 is really strong as well yeah so that could be a little bit uh another big threat Maybe for the opponent, if you, for example, if you lose the turn two initiative, which is always a bit a big deal, you could get like a, a bomb squig and a, and a boy rushing at you at the same time instead of just one. Yeah, I, I think I think the GA two that I've heard the most common is um the the grot getting paired with the bomb squig, but it seems a little boring. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think it's fine. It's nice uh, that now you are able to play both of them, and you, I think. I haven't played them recently without uh, picking uh, the Grot and the Bomb Sweep. Yeah, yeah. Putting, them, putting them as a pair means that you almost always take them, just because the utility of the Grot is generally good, and then you're kind of getting a free Bomb Squig now. Yeah, and you also you don't really care if you lose it like the pretty yeah. early, the Bomb Squig, because at least you <laughs> you were there to just take the, the damage instead of somewhere else. So. Yeah, as long, as long as he doesn't explode next to someone yeah, else. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, watching watching the orcs always play like, where can my bomb squeak not get shot on turn one? It's, pretty, <laughs> yeah. it's a pretty funny mini game to watch as a tournament organizer. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, I think the uh, the bomb squeak has crazy crazy threat range because uh, I think uh, last game I played against uh, end of the archon, I was able. To, uh, I mean, I uh, I had the last activation, so I was able to just move from my uh, diplomat zone with the bomb squeak, like move dash. And then he was in the middle of nowhere. But uh, I knew that if I had in initiative, I would be able to just like charge because the, and uh, I ended up having the initiative. So I was able to just uh, move dash, then end of turn, then initiative, and then move again and explode. So that was yeah. something like, uh, I don't know, 20 and 21 inch move plus the explosion. So two inches. So <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to, uh, to counter. We've circled back to basically commandos having two dynamites. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then if you do just throw them out there like that, even if you do lose the initiative, then they just shoot the bomb squig or get blown up. And like either way, you don't really care if he shoots the bomb squig because, like you said, he was basically free anyways. Yeah, it's just to tank some damage instead of some other good models. So yeah, I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a it's a crazy team right now. I don't think that they're like too far. I feel like if they get like a big nerf, it'll be bad for the overall yeah. game. Because I think, you know, the models are super cool. So it would suck if the team got overly nerfed, but it definitely feels like they need a little bit of a tap somewhere. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with you. Also, I think it's not uh, like, for example, I don't know. I'm not saying that Chaos Kill is super easy to play. Uh, maybe it was before the nerf, even though that was like 15 models. So it's still pretty hard to set up. You have to sync at least a little bit. But I think Commanders, it's a bit different. Still, uh, like there are a lot of combos. You can't, I, I think you can't be really good. Uh, I mean, you have to practice a little bit before to master the team. So it's kind of good reward for some, like, yeah. A lot of training. It, it, it's not an easy team to play, but they do have very yeah. strong plan A of just like setting up three big models that can all do something in the beginning of the first turn. And then your opponent is now playing, how do I play around, you know, the rocket boy on one side, that sniper boy on the other, and then some melee piece in the middle of the board that can charge and fight, right? Yeah. And because of the, just a the scratch, you, don't, you are not like, until you use it, or your opponent use it, you don't know if you, are, we build, we, you will be able to just like kill an, an agent like rel reliably mm -hmm. because you can always use just a scratch. So that's kind of a pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. No, I don't think they need a big nerf, to be honest. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's swing over a little bit to kind of your efforts and kind of the French efforts in general about building up your local communities. I know you're here. Talking a little bit about your, your your smaller scene, but obviously I'm sure there's some commonalities because it sounds like you've talked to the other TOs in your area. So 
kind of curious to see how you guys built up your internal scenes. And if you know, uh, if you have any upcoming tournaments, you know, feel free to give give all the listeners a little bit of a taste of what's coming up in France. So we can maybe start with that. So we have like the um, as we mentioned, I think earlier, we have the finally of the circuit in France. Uh, it will happen the eighth of o- October. Mm-hmm. So that's nice. We already have we already know the players. We already know the lists. So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, we know that it will be three rounds and. Uh, Two will be ITD, one open. We don't know which mission on what map, uh, what setup. So that's the only thing we don't know yet now, I think. Can you tell our listeners the teams that are coming for this invitational? Sure. Um, so we have, I think, uh, two commandos, uh, three legendaries. Oh. Uh, two of them being, I think, at least one of them being uh, Slanesh Nurgle, the other one probably Nurgle Korn. And the last one, I think it's me, and it will be Tsinch and uh, Slanesh, plus, uh, plus Undivided. Okay. And um, we also have one Inquisition player. Uh, I think he is bringing um, Pets plus uh, Navy. What was that? Uh, uh, Pets plus the... Navy? Oh, yeah. okay, okay. Navy. Navy Breacher. All right, cool. Yes. And uh, we have one Phobos player. And I think that's pretty much it. Oh and no, Geller. we have Geller, one Geller Pox player. Okay, <laughs> so three legionaries, two commandos, Geller Pox, Inquisition with Breacher's Vet Guard, and Phobos. But you just snuck in a little comment there that I think you know Jace is probably going to want to dig into. Are you playing Zinch and Slanesh? Yeah, yeah, because uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's a setup I always wanted to just try. You know what? Uh, maybe maybe we'll hold on to it for the niche tactics a little bit. Unless you want to hold your secrets for the for the tournament, we don't want to reveal your secrets before. No, <laughs> before but the, uh, most, the main reason was uh, because I I knew that would, there will be like uh, a lot of um, legendaries, at least two. Mm-hmm. So I thought it would be a good uh, kind of counter to the the AP two uh, plasma or melta, just to have like the four up involved. Mm-hmm. Also, the five up um, kind of little five ish is kind of good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um so that's why also I knew that uh, one player the, the one bringing um uh, one of the commando players I knew he could bring um Elishidian as well. And I know that's again a lot of AP2 so that could be useful against them and uh I know that the one playing um uh Inquisition could also come with uh, either Inquisition or uh, Navy Breaches so I thought it could be again uh, fun or at least um balanced matchup for them so yeah interesting so it was a kind of a metagame call rather than the because most yeah, people just yeah. play nurgle legionaries like most people are still on the i'm never going to switch away from my stinky boys yeah no but i understand them but i i, I played the tournament again already with um nurgle and uh, i think it was corn and i just wanted to try something else also i think I, that uh i checked the results from um the freak wars uh tournament in spain like two weeks ago or something like that Mm-hmm. And um, one of the players ended up third with uh, Cinch and uh, Slanesh, so that was kind of okay. Maybe uh, maybe I can try that just at least for the fun. So yeah, and, I'm excited uh, to see where that goes. Yeah, <laughs> well, we'll we we'll, we'll try to share that uh, at least on the Discord. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds so like what, a... what do you think about Cinch and, uh, and Slanesh? I think that Zinch has a lot of actually good good room for play especially on in the dark because i don't know if most listeners know this but four apl models on in the dark can generally get to your opponent's deployment in one turn on most maps yep. so any map that's a, a shorter edge map if you have four apl you can have someone else open the door for you then you can move dash the other door open the door and then chuck a bomb onto, into your opponent's drop zone so against horde teams on in the dark it you are basically forced to pre-space against zinch legionaries on some level so being able to catch people out is really good there. And then four APL on in the dark is actually very nice play wise. Yeah, so, against elites. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of teams where the four APL is nice. And actually the defensive buffs you can layer on to legionary are pretty good. Four up invuln. And if you get a crit save, you get a normal, like a failed turn into a normal is pretty good against AP2 weaponry. So it's not it's not a bad thing. It's just not as reliable as Nurgle, right? Nurgle, yeah, you're yeah. getting the reliability and you're just not taking as as much damage and you're getting the crit save over the normal. So once you're in cover, it's good. But 
Lethal 5 is nice. Like, I think Zinch has lots of good play. And then Slanesh is one that I think has played, but I've never seen anyone commit hard enough to know. And they, you know, Shane has been on here from Command Point a couple times, and he's talked about how Slanesh has some very niche uses for Gellerpox because they provide yeah. stun. So the Shrive Talon can stun two different Hulks pretty easily. And if you do that, that's almost like the half of the team is dead in this format, right? Because yeah, now uh, Gellerpox have been nerfed so hard that now it's the four dudes have to do all the work. So if a Shrive Talon runs up, kills a dork, minus APLs one, Grizzly marks another, or, you know, does the Slanesh tack ploy to stun two different Gellerpox hulks, it could be a disaster now. So it, it seems like there's some fun play there. Yeah, I was exactly thinking about this uh, this combo. I, I saw that um, one of the legendary player actually told me about this one. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, that's really cool. Uh, yeah, I'm really close to see how it will go. Um, I think it, it's really the commando matchup out of this uh, out of yeah. the eight players here that I would probably be the most worried about because Nurgle Legionary does make the commando matchup much much easier. I think. Yeah, exactly. But uh, that was the bet, right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah know no. that, I know that one of the commandos was either going to with commandos or Elushidian. So <laughs> yeah, no, no, <laughs> it's, it's coming with commandos. So that's that's sad for me, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it's fine. But you guys are doing a three-round just bracket. Yeah, yeah, just a regular Swiss round, uh, nice. tournaments, three rounds, and uh, yeah, just two open, uh, two ITD, one open. Cool. So, yeah, that's yeah. that sounds exciting. Or I mean, I'm excited to see how everyone does. That sounds like a really fun kind of layout. You know, three different kinds of legionary, Inquisition, two commandos, Phobos. Uh, yeah, it sounds it sounds good. Is that kind of a? It does that kind of represent? like the french meta as it were a lot of like a fair like half of the teams are elites and then the other half is kind of everything else um well if we check like the the last tournament we had i think kind of yes um during the last tournament we had in paris uh, we had uh only let me think i think it was 14 players and five of them were commando so i was saying earlier that we don't have many Commando players, but that's why they are. I mean, that's more big that they are not like regular commando players. They're um, they're they're right now commando players. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think apart from that, we also had something like three uh, legionaries. So yeah, it kind of represents like the, the meta now. But I think it it really depends. Uh, also, like for example. Two of them haven't played in tournaments, I think, uh, for a while, so it's pretty hard to to know exactly. But uh, and we don't have like that many tournaments, to be honest. So, so okay. yeah. I think like this year we had something like one tournament per per month, which is already pretty cool compared to the other years. So that's 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 nice. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's it's good to. So you guys have so it. You were, I think we mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast, but the French scene has multiple TOs and you guys are all kind of in one holistic bracket now. So when you guys are setting up each month for the year, how have you guys been scheduling those tournaments? Um, so, yeah, I think like before the before the, the world, uh, as we call them, uh, I think we were just like, we knew that uh, we are several TOs because they are like, we have, again, we have a very small community. So... We are small TOs, but we are also players. So, for example, if uh, Francois is uh, planning to run a tournament, I know that I, will, I won't be a TO, but I will be a player there. So we all know each other pretty well. Um, and we have different, sometimes different visions on how things should be run, but that's that's completely fine. And then uh, when the worlds were announced, I think we just like took some time to discuss them together and just agree on the format. Also, it was pretty short notice, so we had to find a, a solution for that. And uh, yeah, we just agreed on uh, I don't know just uh, on the fact to just organize like one uh, tournament each, like not to spam all the events at the same place. So again, all the TOs are not from the same like city. So we just knew that uh, we will be able to just uh, schedule tournaments for several cities. So that was pretty nice actually. So for example, we had Paris. Uh, Francois uh, Solinounet is. Um, uh, in Boulogne Biancourt, so it's like uh, five or five kilometers, or f- five kilometers or so from Paris, so that's super close. Mm-hmm. We have like uh, Rouen, and I think it's one hour and a half uh, by by car, so that's pretty easy to to get there. I mean, everything is like much smaller than other countries, like maybe f- most likely in the US. 
Oh yeah, so, we don't, the U.S. doesn't count. The U.S. is like the size of multiple yeah. countries in these discussions. So I'm always in awe of like you know all the smaller scenes. It's like oh yeah, it'd be really cool if we could have three other scenes within two hours driving when it's like four hours away to the next largest scene in the Northeast. And that's like the Northeast is one region. <laughs> no, that's that's so, so, so much smaller compared to the US. That's <laughs> really easy no. for us to go for all that announce. So yeah, and the, we just agreed on that. We just uh, agreed on the fact that we wanted to have at least one tournament per month. And so mm-hmm. we just took like the, what was <laughs> available for us or, and we just, uh, uh, made the announcements for the player to know where and when they can try to get uh, access to uh, the qualifiers for the, the for the run finale. So, if people who are listening to this podcast wanted to play in France, would it be on the Facebook that they would go through, or would you know how? What would be the easiest way to kind of touch base if anyone is listening to this podcast and wants to play in France? So, I think the the easier the, the main entry point is Facebook, or at least was for a while. And I think it's still the, the case. So the the Kill Team France um, uh, Facebook page is like the biggest community we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, I think we have like three thousand people there. Uh, most of them are maybe not like super active, but at least they are there. And uh, then I think the people, the more the most active people are now joining uh, Discord, and this is where like the, we do most of the communication. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Discord is just a little bit more dynamic, right? Yeah, it's super easy to just schedule games. You, if you want to go for something like a LFG, or <laughs> you can just find a game pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's the the easier solution now. Okay, and do each of you have your own store that you guys are kind of based out of, or how does how has that been working? Um, it's it happens. It, it depends on the city, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know about Strasbourg. I know that in Rouen, it's a, it's a store. So people just go there. The store is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the tournaments we've done there were super cool. They are very uh, super like uh, nice when you are a newcomer. I know that a lot of new players are also joining there. Um, for Paris, uh, since last year, I think, we had um, a new cafe uh, called the French Wargame Cafe. And um, it's... Uh, it's a cafe like owned by uh, I think the biggest YouTuber, uh, 40k YouTuber we have in France. Okay. Uh, French cool. Game Studio. So they just started to they just created this cafe, and so you have something like I would say 20 to 30 tables. Um, wow. So that's pretty big, and uh, that's nice because you have like um, a lot of 40k players, a lot of uh, Age of Sigmar players, but also a lot of the rings or. War Machine, Marvel, and all that. And when they see like a Kill Team boards, uh, they are like curious and they want to know how it's playing. So that's, that's nice. That's a good way to onboard people as well. Yeah, um, a- but we have like yeah. also group of people able to create corporations, I think it's called. So we call that uh, association, but uh, it's basically a group of people you create like a jur- juridic form, like, a, and then you are able to just ask the city you where you live or where it's uh, located to like rent some uh, places to play where to, we want to play. Mm-hmm. So we have okay. a lot of that. In France like renting well. renting public spaces from your whatever your cities are to run these yes. tournaments. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. So that's uh, something that's like pretty common in France. I don't know how common that would be in the U.S. So <laughs> we don't have as many public services in the U.S. No, oh, yeah, that's uh, it's just a U.S. The... problem. We don't really have like publicly rentable spaces for a day like that that I know of much either. Sounds I'm I'm a little jealous. <laughs> I'll be honest. It does sound fun. <laughs> no, that's nice. Also, I think that's that's pretty cool to have like uh, all those tiers because it's not always like if you have just one uh, like uh, mentor, one people just uh, uh, in charge of organizing all the tournaments. That's a lot of work. Now at least we know that during the year you will be uh, you will have something like two or three. At least two, three or um, events per uh, year, so that's not always on you to, to plan things. So that's that's pretty cool as well. Yeah, share the load, find your community, and kind of divvy up the work. Yes, exactly. And how have you guys been building up the scene for kind of like newer entries? I think you were saying that at this board game cafe that the this famous YouTuber has done, it's a little bit more organic just because there's more people around. But how do you know how your uh, other French TOs have been doing it? Or how you've been doing it yourself? Uh, 
for example, uh, I think on my side, just by talking to people around, like uh, I had some, some colleagues at work and I just told them that I was playing a kill team and just explained them very quickly. And then they said, like, I think most of, a uh, lot of people were playing when they were, they were younger. So they still had like uh, some models like Space Marines or anything like yeah. that. And so they were, they were just like, oh, okay, we could try. And then they were, they were very into it. I think I was able to go on board like recently three people like that. Oh wow, that's super cool. And um, I know that um, in uh, Boulogne Biancourt they do kind of the same because it's it's a place like called Lidotech where you can just come and play board games. It's one okay. of those uh, association, you know, I was okay. mentioning before. And so it's it, the place is pretty big, and so they were able to just um, like bring more people there. But I think Francois could. Uh, Say talk more about that uh, than me than I should, but uh, okay, all <laughs> I right, think yeah. that's a, a good um, good place where to like uh, find people like at least curious to see how it plays and maybe jump in. Hopefully, next time we swing by France, we'll pick up Lunet and we'll uh, catch up with him and talk to him a little bit about his his part his slice of the French scene. Nice, yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you guys have been doing some really cool stuff out in France. You've got your top eight invitational with three legionaries, two commandos, Gellerpox, Inquisition, and Phobos. And then you guys have your individual scenes and you guys are all working together to make one holistic year long, year long bracket, which I think is really cool. Yeah, it was super nice, to be honest. Uh, I think it was, it was not that easy at the beginning, but uh, in the end, it was, I mean, the, the, everything went super well. And I think we will try to do it next year, depending on what was what will be planned by games. Okay. But yeah. uh, we will most likely do things differently. We try to onboard more and more people because, again, I think like if we take this year for example, we had like in total, I think we had forty-five players uh, who took part to events counting for the circuit. So it's mm -hmm. like super small. But uh, if you check that uh, compared to other years, it's uh, it's getting better, and we are able to have like I think the biggest event was 24 players. So again, it's pretty small, but uh, yeah, I think it's at least in moving into the right direction. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially after you guys go to the world championships and you get some you know world practice, you can see how everyone's <laughs> backed up and bring out bring back information, right? Yeah. Exactly. Also, we kind of uh, we have like a um, small group of players also playing on TTS. So okay, nice. That's a good way to try to play against uh, other other people. And we have actually, I think, like one player, one French player is going to basically not all, but a lot of <laughs> uh, events in the UK. Uh, it's called Remy Duran. Okay. So yeah. We have some re representation uh, <laughs> abroad. You're gonna have a little bit more at the, you know, in November. Yeah, I hope. I hope that's, that's you know. Nice. Originally, we were gonna do this niche tactics for Chaos Cults, but I think after hearing that you're playing Sinesh Zinge, maybe we should just talk about Legionnaires. What do you think, Jason? Yeah, I think that would be fun. It's a nice little fresh twist. Niche tactics. And we can talk a little bit about. You said you, uh, Cedric, you played a little bit of Corn. So, you know, Jason out here has been spreading the good word about corn for the last like three podcasts. So what has your experience been with corn? Like, where have you found them to be good? How do you like catch people or do you feel like it's better than it, it looks? Um, so it, it's it was a while ago, to be honest, but um, I think I like the, the fact to be able to have like uh, at least one or two super big threats, uh, like being able to charge multiple models at once. And like pretty effectively, uh, so that's the main reason why. But I think I ended up playing Nuggle or full Nuggles most of the time. Okay. So <laughs> that's my experience with Scorn, <laughs> basically. Okay. So it was. So did you bring them out more on In the Dark, or were you mostly just playing Nurgle? And now, now that you've played Nurgle for so long, you want to switch over and do something a little bit more different. Yeah, I think that's 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 that because when we when I played um, Corn and um, and um, Nurgle, it was I think uh, Into the Dark wasn't really when it wasn't released. Okay. So I have no experience with Corn in Into the Dark. I think when I think it maybe it's easier to play now because with Into the Dark you can you can maybe hide a little bit more easily. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, 
And now I think that's more like uh, Cinch. It's basically because I always wanted to try that. Okay. Um, also, I, I don't have like tons of expectations for this uh, event, like the, this fin this finale, because I know that I won't be able to join in Atlanta anyway. Because ah. I think that's the date where I'm supposed to be father for the second time. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so it will be really hard to negotiate. I and, see. Uh, doing it for fun. Yeah, it's mostly for fun. But um, and I still think it was a good pick uh, if uh, more people would have bring uh, AP <laughs> threats. Okay. Mostly. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, maybe. Okay. You, so you've been playing Legionary, Commandos, Chaos Cults. What do you find has been the biggest upgrade on your win rate, or kind of like that you for when you approach in the darker open? Because I think a lot of players kind of can struggle with one or the other. If you are used to playing shooty teams in the dark can be a big struggle. If you're used to playing melee teams, open can be a big struggle. But for a team that can do both, how do you context switch between the two maps? What kind of play things have you found useful? So you mean by uh, when you need to switch between uh, into the garden and open? Like, I know some players struggle with one or the other. How do you approach those two formats? And what do you think you would tell other people to do when approaching those formats? Well, I think that um, what I try to do is um, work a lot with uh, TTS, to be honest, because it's pretty easy to just like try to set up some deployments. Okay. Uh, especially if you play odds. Uh, when I was running Chaos Cult, so okay, Chaos Cult was completely broken, but still you have to manage like 15 bodies, and uh, mm -hmm. it can be when you are playing on um, like uh, map packs, like turning point tactics. You know that you can practice a little bit on okay. uh, those setup. So I just try to yeah, uh, especially work on the deployments and see what could be the the plan for at least turn point one and two. Uh, no matter the the opponent. Okay, so you were doing a little bit of theory crafting on your on your own on TTS. Yeah, because I think it's super hard if you don't do it. Like, and you play like uh, if you play lit, I think it's uh, easier because mm -hmm. uh, into the dark you, I mean, you will play two uh, legionaries there, maybe one, one, and uh, another two. I don't know, but it's like six bodies to just uh, run compared to like odds where you need to like. I mean, they are all complementary, so you need to know exactly how you want to manage your buffs and all mm -hmm. that. So that's yeah, pretty hard in Into the Dark, at least from my point of view. Okay, so you were doing a lot of theory crafting, and yeah. because you knew there were map packs, you were able to use the map packs and actually practice a little bit. Yeah, just like not farming the map pack, because uh, mm -hmm. I think there are, four, for example, I think for Tony Pro Tactics, there is something like uh, 45 combinations possible or something like that. So it's pretty hard to... <laughs> Farm all of those, but uh, yeah, just to have like some practice at least, especially if you need to play in tournaments where you, the time is uh, something like you can run off pretty quickly. So yeah. Okay, so when you're looking at chaos cults, what things were you doing, focusing on on setup, making sure that things were pre-spaced, or making sure that you had plays for you know turn one? Were you trying to make aggressive plays, or just set up for turn two more often with chaos cults? Yeah, I or even with four teams in general, I think. Well, for Chaos Team, I think most of the time now I'm trying to play very KG turn one. Or at least, um, I mean, for Chaos Cult, it was a bit different because you still had like a few models to spare. But uh, there is something like uh, an economy to have with the, the cultists to be able to not to run out of mutants, but also to be able to do mission action and all that. So you still need to play a little bit KG. Also, you mm -hmm. might want to make sure to be able to uh, keep your early mutants alive, at least turn one, to be able to go to one, turn two. So I was playing most of the time pretty KG, yes, I think, no matter ITD or open. Okay, well, making sure that your mutants for turn two are always in a safe spot. Yeah, maybe set up. Also, it's, um, if you play against two, uh, two APL teams, uh, it's pretty easy to set up for uh, eliminate guards. Uh, on the maps where they need to stay on the objective, so... Yeah, so for loot and secure, you're able to catch people on top of points for eliminate guards. Yeah, especially if you are able to... Because I was trying to always place the term, the, um, the mutants somewhere where I knew that they will be useful for turn two, maybe a charge or something, most likely a charge, um, for, for cultists at least, and so, yeah. Yeah, and I think... To... I think on In the Dark, a good way to keep mutants 
in hiding spots is instead of being in the middle of rooms, you can put them to like the sides of room away from where the doors are, because that means that people can't guard inside rooms and yeah. uh, people can't do things like vet guard spotter and the Imperial Guard dro- like robot. Because if you're off to the side, your opponents now have to fully get inside the room. So if you have a little bit of room to run, you can run into the corners rather than into the middles of the rooms for models that you really don't want to get shot on turn one, even if your opponent has a trick. Or if they do have a trick, now they're standing in the middle of the room so you can counter punch them. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I think I also try to uh, get some value from the Dark Commons agents as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that the leader, I think the leader was most of the time just staying in the back to mutate uh, one agent per turn. But yeah, um, always in the back, mutating his yeah. friends. Yeah, but the Mind Witch was uh, actually uh, one of uh, maybe the MVP most of the time. Because the Flamer, like everyone was super scared about the Flamer. Mm-hmm. So it was actually pretty hard to set up something because still have AP2, uh, two APs. So it's pretty hard to just like, I mean, you have to go uh, move dash and then uh rely on the fact that the opponent might have just uh, a pa- set up something like a pack of agents that you can just flame but it mm-hmm. doesn't happen too often where i think they just not like um took as many like care against the mind witch where you can just like uh, remove one apl do this do that it was pretty pretty neat yeah the mind witch is definitely a more got a lot of power because now she doesn't require babying yeah yeah, because the big nerf for the team was that the Icon Arc actually cost APL to turn on her auras, right? And now that means that she can't, you know, defend and flame people and do everything, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's still an Icon Bearer, and it's still like, you. I think I would use it more like uh, just to use the auras more than to use the Flamer. Mm-hmm. Because it's, uh, it's something you can easily set up, but I yeah, would I... use something like just to ensure that the middens can live a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, more than to just kill. Also, it's still an icon bearer, so it's I can still move up and steal steal a point yeah. reliably. Yeah, it still does a bunch of stuff, but now it doesn't do literally everything. Yeah, exactly. It was way way too strong. Like uh, <laughs> the flamer, like uh, three four damage, <laughs> six mm-hmm. shots on two. So, uh, what is so are you about? are you playing uh, two torments at the opening of turn two? Like um, like I think before that's what people were doing. When do you, when are your torments coming out? How are you trying to? Budget your torments throughout the course of the game. I think I was trying to use them most as soon as I can. Like uh, most of the time, I for sure I had two torments turn two. Um, then it depends on the mission because again you still need to be able to do mission actions, and when you have torments, you are not able to do it anymore. So you can't like chuck all of your cultists because you still need them to go do the mission action. Yeah. Also, you can do mission actions with the dark commons, but they tend to die at some point. So. Yeah, I don't. I think I, uh, most of the time I was running two torments uh, at the beginning of turn two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if this thing. What do you think about that for after the buff? The uh, sorry, the nerf. I haven't played them enough for me to have a strong opinion on when I would want to be tormenting. I think that two torments on the opening of two is probably a good idea, but I don't know if I would have them be the very first activations of the turn anymore. Oh. Or I might have one go up forward and have the other one kind of at the mid-range to defend the front line. Yeah, because if, the, if both of them die, it's hard for... Su- on, against some teams, getting the second wave of mutants can be hard then. Yep. Whereas if you have one torment and your opponent you know moves up incorrectly, then that second torment can maybe do in the middle of the turn and kind of open up weak models for your mutants to for your cultists to go mutate against right yeah also if you keep more mutants it's more options for later if you want to yeah. mutate at the end of turn two so, yeah, yeah. I, yeah i've always wondered about whether or not you actually wanted to do two torments right at the beginning of turn two to be in your opponent's face especially now because you're the rest of your dorks are much worse than they used to be i think pre nerf I... when the commune had the injury bubble you could kind of throw models away because you, your opponents were just so bad at <laughs> melee against this team. Yeah. No, but I think uh, most of the time I was, uh, you have to have like uh, one uh, torment at the beginning of turn two, mm-hmm. and then you know, the second one, you can delay it because it's after the activation of the leader. And I think I didn't do it like first activation mm-hmm. because I was always able to just uh, hide the mutant enough to make sure I was able to, I would be able to do it later. So yeah. 
I think it really depends on the matchup as well. So yeah, I think yeah, I think the big thing is on turn one you have two mutants. Turn two you either have two torments or you have one torment, two mutants, right? Yeah. So then you can decide where you want to go for turn three. Because mm-hmm. you'll so, have yes. th- yeah, you'll have three mutations at the top of two, and then next turn you'll have uh, five or. Yeah, four, yeah. four, four. Because like um, that. that's yeah, turn three would be three plus one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I would expect that you don't want two of them in your opponent's face right away. Because I have seen games where the two torments they get like one or two, one and a half kills, right? And then they die, and then you're kind of stuck. Yeah, which I think would be really bad now because now it's way less reliable. Like your both your mutants and your torments are less reliable as far defensively. Because they have six up field no pains instead of the five up field no pains. Yeah, but I think it's uh, it's for the best. But uh, the yeah, I, I think it's for the best too. I don't, I don't, I don't think the team came out in a spot that made a whole lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. No, that was a, a bit too, too much, <laughs> too much of everything apart from shooting. But yeah. But yeah, I had some uh, some games. I think it was against uh, Commandos. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had like two tournaments at the beginning of uh, one turn, and I was trying to push on one specific side and for some reason i don't remember exactly how things went but i know that the the rocket uh, just killed like uh, in one activation one of the torments and mm-hmm. next turn killed another one it was starting to get pretty pretty hard because <laughs> when you lose your torments too fast it's a, it's a little bit uh, hard to to catch up so yeah cuz they they need to do a lot of work yeah, for yeah. the team right now. Like because the Dark Commune got nerfed hard enough where they're no longer just as strong. Because before the two Blessed Blades were better than most of your mutants, but your mutants were also relentless. So it's like you just yeah. had so many melee pieces. So you could afford to lose melee pieces. Now you really can't afford to lose a torment early because it has to do probably like two models worth of work. Which it which it can definitely do. It's just it can't it has to do two models worth of work. Whereas before you had models that could all trade one for one pretty easily, which is not necessarily the case now that mutants are down to ceaseless. So being, I would expect that having a mutant be in your, or your, a torment be in your second wave of um, melee on turn two would probably be a good idea. Yeah, also I think you don't really have to, to go for two torments like right away. Yeah, exactly. I think you can, you should probably... Give it a little bit of time to see where your opponent is going and then go from there. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, if you can get a spare mutant floating around somewhere because your opponent, you know, gives you a model that you can go and go and slap, that's always nice. Yeah, I think it, it really depends again on the on the mission and uh, the opponent as well, because I think one of the craziest game I had was against uh, veterans uh, in ITD on capture. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of ridiculous. The the the, the player was a uh, super like great player, and then it was I was just able to open the door, fight, uh, and just like uh, transform or uh, mutate, and then it was like I think uh, by the end of turn two I had like almost every cultist was a mutant because it's you just needed to like inflict damage and then survive, so you can yeah, just damage. marry. Yeah, and then because it's capture, you don't need to do any mission action. So, oh yeah, <laughs> capture is the... definitely for sure their best their best yeah. mission. This was completely crazy. <laughs> but yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, one it of the big things, crazy. some other tricky plays that come up. I think I mentioned this before, but Mind Witch can give the minus APL to models that are in combat. So if you tie up a model, you can actually subtract an APL from someone, and then your torment or your mutant is now winning an objective, which can be a good surprise play. I think it's also true for the um, the mortal wounds. Yeah, you, you just need line of sight. Yeah, you just need oh, okay, line okay. of sight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's but like cool. being able to subtract an APL is a really big deal, like yeah, mid combat, because yeah, yeah. like end of three, if your opponent ha- is down to like you're both down to similar models, you can actually subtract an APL from someone who's like locked up in melee, and then that person yeah. is just gonna lose the point. So that's a really nice trick play that can come up. Don't forget that the Blessed Blades can double down on people. Not that I think that really comes up all that often. Um, yeah, and besides uh, lose, like using the minus APL to steal an objective, you can also use that to trap someone in melee. Mm-hmm. And then you can just like hold that model hostage to then like kill and charge into someone else. And, and that's a really good combo too. 
Yeah, because and if you have a torment with a relentless plus combat support, you also hit on threes instead of four. So that's uh, I think the the blades I was using them most like most of the time just as combat support or utility instead of just like a, a melee threat because they, I think they hit on four. You don't yeah. have any reroll and they just have eight wounds, so it's like super dicey. And they just when I try to fight with them, I was just end up like dying doing nothing. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> But you can like have them charge, empty charge to hold points, and then have your your actual guys come in and give combat support to them. Yeah. So yeah. Um, how often? Yeah. I mean, I think those are all those are all good points. Um, yeah, I like that. That's a version to... of the blessed blades that I hadn't heard, and I think that's a good. I think that's a smart approach. Yeah. All right. Well, it sounds like we're running out of stuff to talk about. So. You know, let's cover the end of the end of the podcast stuff. You know, me and Jason both have our respective tournaments. It sounds like Cedric's got some cool French tournament news coming up. Hopefully, you know, people can follow that up the week. I think this will come out on October first. So it sounds like you guys will be at the end of the week, end of that week, right? For your um, big invitational. Yeah, it's the eighth uh, mm -hmm. of October. So and, we'll, uh, we're looking forward to hearing about that. Were there any other upcoming tournaments you want to give a shout out anywhere else in uh, France? Not really for now. I think like uh, for now we just uh, worked on the um, yeah the circuit, and I think like we after this one we just start to think about uh, what's what's next. Uh, I know that with some of the TOs uh, in Paris, we are because I'm not alone in Paris. I also work with I think Aero on Discord and Tutor you mentioned uh, before, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll try to run more more and more like tournaments in um, uh, the French Wargame Cafe, uh, trying to follow a little bit what is has been done in uh, in the UK, I think, where they just like started to plan very like uh, scheduled like a uh, lot of tournaments just to make sure like you can have uh, more and more people every time. So mm -hmm. we try to do that and have like at least two or three uh, for the beginning of uh, 2024, and uh, yeah, start from there. <laughs> I mean, hopefully we'll uh, swing back to France sometime early next year, so we can hear all about the updates. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again for coming on, Cedric. It's been fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, listeners, for listening once again. Yes, you made it to the end. Congratulations. Thank you.